There is so much in this world that we don't know, so much to further discover. There are things in our universe that are hard to even imagine, yet so fascinating, once you start looking into them, you get hooked. You simply can't stop. Here's how it all began. During my senior year in high school, I was getting more and more fascinated by the world of physics. I was looking into things that were yet to discover, looking how I could get involved in the wonderful world of science. One morning, I got up at 5 a.m. to go on a field trip to a cosmic ray observatory. It was a four-hour drive, two of which were through a desert, through which these cosmic ray detectors were scattered, hundreds and hundreds of them up to the horizon. That very field trip got me thinking, even though the particles are so small, the targets needed to detect them are massive. A particle that especially caught my attention was the neutrino. Neutrinos are the ghosts of the subatomic world. They have very little mass, absolutely no charge, and they're in, the universe is invisible to them. Yet, 650 trillion of them pass through each of you every second. And even though you're bombarded by them, it took about 30 years to even prove that they exist. Why is that? Well, out of the four forces in the world, gravity, electromagnetism, strong nuclear force, and weak nuclear force, neutrinos interact only by gravity and the weak nuclear force. Now, for gravity interactions, the mass of the neutrino is so pathetically small that its interactions with any other object in the universe are completely trivial. The weak nuclear force, I think, speaks for itself. To demonstrate to you how weak it is, suppose you wanted to shield yourself from all those neutrinos bombarding you. You would need five light years of lead to have even a slight chance of stopping a neutrino. And even in that situation, there's a possibility that it'll ignore all that not bump into any atoms, and just continue on flying. There are a lot of neutrino detectors in the world, one bigger than the other. Some of them are the Super Kamiokande experiment, Mino, Santaris, Ice Cube, and many, many others. All of them function on pretty much the same principle, setting up a large target volume, and waiting for a neutrino to collide with one of the atoms so you can detect that collision. One of the first experiments, for example, was simply a large tank of cleaning fluid, so mostly chlorine. The idea is that most neutrinos just pass through it, ignoring that it ever exists. But once in a while, you get a neutrino bumping into a chlorine atom and transmuting it into an argon atom. That is a property of the weak nuclear force. It can change the nature of a chemical element. More and more detectors are built to detect more energetic and consequently rarer events. Yet, no more than a couple of dozen neutrinos are getting detected. The detectors grow bigger, but the productivity remains the same. And I started to wonder how I could change that. I decided to start an innovative research team to develop and build a new neutrino detector, the one that would increase the productivity of the current detectors. As soon as I started college, I started approaching students interested in revolutionary research and challenging tasks. Ryzen was one of the first people I talked to and was very excited for the opportunity. So to begin, <clears throat> I want to tell you all a story. In order to do so, I'm going to have to rewind time just a little bit. Approximately 18 years. Okay, I was a little three-year-old, rising, cross-eyed. Um, I was a little cute kid, um, and it's my earliest memory at Advantage Preschool in West Valley, Utah. I was getting ready to sing "I Like School" for my uh, preschool singing performance. I don't know if you guys know that song, the "I Like School." And, anyways, um, and they asked me with the grandest question of all. 
what do you want to be when you're older? Well, and I'm mind blown. I don't even know my left from my right foot when I'm three years old and I'm supposed to know what I want to be when I'm older. But I narrowed it down to three ideas. First, I want to play baseball. I want to be a shortstop for the Yankees. Two, I want to be an astronaut. I thought astronauts looked cool. They got to float around in space. And last but definitely not least, I want to be a dinosaur. <laughs> so I grabbed that mic and I blurted, I want to be an astronaut like the ones that are saving the planet from asteroids and aliens. Total boy stuff. But as time went on, my interest changed. I wanted to build houses for the homeless. Then I met one of my idols, ex-president Jimmy Carter. And then I wanted to be president of the United States. And now, my current goal is I want to conduct cancer research and find a cure to cancer. And while my ideas and my aspirations have changed over time, and who knows, they may change more, I've kept one idea in mind, and that's my love for space. And I love everything about it, all the mystique, the vastness of space, the, the comets, the shooting stars, planets. Everything about it's fascinating to me. So I told myself that before I died, I wanted to be involved in space in one way or another. And little did I know I'd have an 8 a.m. physics course with Elizabeth, and she'd present me with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that would allow me to relive these dreams. The name of our team is Quasar, Quest to Uncover Astroscience for Academic Research. The method of neutrino detection proposed by Quasar should be more effective than any of the current functioning detectors on Earth. The radio method of neutrino detection. It is based on two concepts, the Ascarian effect and the Cherenkov radiation. The Ascarian effect is the phenomena that occurs when a particle passes through a dielectric medium and produces a shower of secondary particles and a cone of coherent radiation. The Cherenkov radiation is the radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum produced by that particle passing through a medium at a velocity greater than a phase velocity of light in that medium. Both of these situations result in radiation emission that can be further detected by a satellite-borne antenna. The detector, which is a lunar orbital radio detector, uh, provides high sensitivity combined with a large target volume. Detection using the moon as the target for neutrino detection results in many benefits. First one is the enormous mass that can be surveyed by a satellite-borne antenna. Second, the short detection distance, which ranges from a few hundred to a few thousand kilometers, compared to the detection distance on Earth, which is on average 400,000 kilometers. And lastly, most important, the fact that there is no background radiation and no noise. The moon has no atmosphere, which makes it really easy to detect the short nanosecond pulses of neutrinos colliding with the regolith. Our, uh, the antenna will be installed aboard an artificial lunar satellite, which, whose orbit will range from about 100 to 1,000 kilometers above the moon's surface. It will detect those short pulses of the neutrino collisions with the regolith and transmit the data back to us. The flux of particles at these energies is so incredibly small that according to our current understanding of the universe, they should not even exist because of the GZK or the Grayson that Sapin Kuzmin cut off. Yet, we see them. Our experiment can help solve the GZK cutoff paradox. I think that we have designed a simply beautiful satellite. We have a team of engineers up at the University of Utah who have been hard at work. And they have an incredible access to databases, softwares, and access to some of the highest, tech, highest grade technology in the world. And with their expertise, their knowledge, and these resources, they've come up with this. 
This here is our six unit cube satellite. It's comprised of six little cubes that are each 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. They are constructed of aluminum alloy, which is one of the toughest metals in spacecraft. And it also is able to withstand the tough, the tough uh, conditions, if you must, if you might, of space. As well as the six units, it provides a large space for not only mechanisms to communicate between Earth and lunar orbit, but it's also help stabilize our satellite after it leaves a rocket. On the top end of our satellite, you can see four solar panels, which will help power all of our mechanisms. In addition to the solar panels, we also have thrust located at the bottom, which helps distribute our force along our satellite. Now, I myself am the head of the ACS department. And ACS stands for Attitude Control Systems. When a satellite is launched via rocket into space, it exits the Earth's atmosphere and releases this satellite. But when the satellite is released, it's all topsy-turvy. It's spinning, it's rotating in ways it shouldn't. It might even be facing the wrong direction, which is a problem, obviously. So how do we fix this? Well, ACS, Attitude Control Systems, deals with a series of small thrusts. And these thrusts help orient the satellite in the correct position so we can get to a correct stage for lunar orbit. Now, with our satellite, I can't be up in space, obviously, and I can't direct this satellite. So we had to figure a way of how we could control this from Earth. And thanks to scientists at NASA, they've developed a software known as GMAT. And what GMAT does is first, you take a theoretical orbit path like such. As you can see here, in the stage one to two, our satellite is rotating around the Earth. It's in orbit, in Earth's orbit, by its gravitational pull. Then, in stage three, it gains a wider orbit off this thrust, eventually slingshotting us to four into lunar orbit. Now, the hard part of this is figuring when we thrust, how much we thrust where we thrust when we stop. But this software, this GMAT software, takes this theoretical trajectory and we input our satellite's parameters, its height, its weight, the fuel we use, et cetera, et cetera. And then it adjusts this trajectory and spews out information on when we need to thrust, how much we need to thrust, enter orbit, exit orbit, all the information we need, which really simplifies our job a ton. Without ACS, though, our satellite would be sent tumbling deep into outer space uncontrollably. Now, at the very beginning, the Big Bang, lots of energy was produced, lots of particles, neutrinos, photons, electrons. Well, I wasn't actually there, so I just imagined that. But a lot of particles, elementary particles, were created. Neutrinos photons, electrons, other elementary particles, things we haven't even seen yet. We all know about the microwave background in space. It is the relic photons from the very beginning that can tell us of how the universe was born about its first days. Neutrinos, if we can grab them, can tell us even more about it. The universe is invisible to neutrinos. They've been zooming around since the beginning of time, collecting information. The neutrino background is an equivalent to the photon background. Our satellite holds the potential to detect those relic neutrinos. As an example, right here, if you take a small volume of air, right here, one cubic centimeter, there will be about 56, 60, maybe 100 of those neutrinos. And I'm not talking about the trillions that are zapping right through you. I'm talking the ones that were created in the Big Bang, in the first minutes, seconds, hours of our universe. The ones that's been here all this time. Our satellite has the potential to detect them, to completely change our understanding of the universe and the fundamentals of physics. 
Neutrinos have been a mystery in modern day particle physics and astrophysics. And our method of detection can help demystify this particle. And not only do we want to advance the field of physics, but we want to challenge every single mind in our ever-growing world. From the little three-year-old in preschool, all the way to the 65-year-old physician running his practice. We'd like you to challenge you, dig deep down inside, and pull out the craziest idea you have, the craziest dream you had from when you were little, and run with it. Make a difference in the world, make your name known, make a difference that'll last a lifetime because nothing will happen if you don't give it a shot. We believe that not only we can change physics, but we can provide an idea that two broke college students can put a satellite up into space. So imagine the possibilities if everyone ran their wildest dreams. We are detecting the undetectable. Thank you.